you can see all of it. In fact, I, I, I want to also just say, uh, Sister Harris, good to see you. The last time we, we saw you, you were joining the church. Next thing we know, you were out uh, uh, going to the ER. I, I know she stepped out for a minute, but we're glad that she was able to be with us for worship this morning. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Amen? Amen. We can now rest on your feet for the reading of God. From the New King James Version of the Bible, the Word of God reads, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the praises that have gone up and we believe that blessings will come down. I pray, Father, that today you would allow your spirit to work for me for your glory, that this body of Christ will be edified, and that you, Holy Father, will be glorified. Lord, do a work in us today that will last a lifetime. We give you honor and praise, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated once again in the presence of God, and we thank you us this morning for your service. Today we're going to continue with no more excuses. No more excuses. As I shared with you last week, the book of Hebrews is a powerful book. It is, but we don't know who the writer is because there's no signature. So there are some who believe it may have been written by the Apostle Paul. There are some who believe it may have been written by Apollos, but we're just not sure who the writer is for the book of Hebrews. But what is important to know is that Hebrews was written to a group of uh, Jewish Christians, some, some, some Jews who had become Christians who were making a decision to go back to Judaism. They were just going to renounce Jesus Christ and go back to being Jews. So the writer of Hebrews uh, wrote to them to explain to them that Jesus Christ is the answer. And then not only is he the answer, but he is the fulfillment of all the things in the Old Testament. So if you've ever read the Old Testament and didn't quite understand it, and you read part of the New Testament and you're not sure how they fit together, the book of Hebrews explains it. It puts it all together for you so you can see it in one place. So what we're doing here in this, this series is we're looking at some passages in Hebrews in chapters 1 through 6 to gain an understanding of what's expected of us. Because I believe as Christians, we've made a lot of excuses. We've made a lot of excuses for why we, we don't worship. We've made a lot of excuses for why we don't read the Bible. We've made a lot of excuses for how we live instead of living the life that God has called us to live. And as we make these excuses, the world is looking at us. And the world is watching us. And, and, and it's time now, with all the changes that are going on in our world, it's time now for the body of Christ to stand up and be the body of Christ. Yeah. It's time for us to really be who God has called us to be. Because they are so confused about what a Christian is that they are now asking the church to change. And I, I don't know about you, but the, the, the word of God is eternal. It's not changing. And because it's not changing, we, we can't just change to the whims of the world. We must always be who God called us to be. So last week, I encouraged you to believe in God. No more excuses about God. We need to believe in God completely and totally. We must hear the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. And we must receive that gospel. And, and then we must confirm it. We must actually go about the business of making our calling and election sure. So that we understand what we have been called to and why we have been called to be Christians. That was last week. This week, this week, I want to share with you a message entitled, No More Excuses About Growing. No More Excuses About Growing. And I hope that by the time we're done today, you will be thoroughly equipped to not only go about the process of growing in your faith, but you will understand the reasons why. 
Amen? First thing I want to share with you today is, honestly, we are expected to grow. Yes, sir. We are expected to grow. Let's look back at the verses. Let's, let's go back to verse 12. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. He goes on to say, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. But listen, the, the, writer, the writer of Hebrews does not expressly say, hey, we expect you to grow. But I think by reading these verses and hearing what he's talking about, the examples that he's given of a babe versus someone who is fully grown, he is showing us that there is an expectation. Yes, sir. We need to grow. Yes. We, we, we've been saved, and that's great. But everybody, we, we thank God and we give him joy for our salvation, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But there's more. There's something more that comes after that. There, there should be some progress being made in our lives. And there, there should be some maturity going on and, and the spiritual maturity there is. There, there should even be some change. That we can't remain the same if we're truly in Christ Jesus. There's got to be some growth. We should all grow. Tell your neighbor, we should all grow. We should all grow. Now, we may all grow at different levels and we may grow at a different pace, but, but we're all expected to grow. You know, I, some of you have, have seen uh, me share a picture or two, and some of you follow me on social media, and you know that I have a bucket garden. Because um, I don't have that big of a backyard, so I got everything in five-gallon buckets. And my wife and I, we wash that garden like a hawk, I tell you. The bucket garden is, is where it's at for us. And, and up at the top left, you'll see, that was the day we left Home Depot. And forgive me, Sister Patrick, I went to Home Depot, not Lowe's. We're going to work on it. But we went to Home Depot, and I got buckets, and I got all and all my stuff, and you see I got some miracle grow back there, some any many plants. When I take that stuff to the house, I'm expecting to get something in return. I'm expecting when I water it, it ought to grow. When I put it in some good soil, it ought to grow. If I'm pouring compost on it because I make my own compost, I'm expecting it to grow. At some point, I didn't know what an okra plant looked like, but I just knew that after a certain number of days, it ought to be okra. I was outside dancing around that place like, oh, look, it's okra. I had no idea what it looked like. Strawberries, I didn't know how they grew, but I knew they were going to grow in that bucket. I didn't care if it was a running plan or not. It went in that bucket. Because I, I had an expectation that, that if I was going to put in the time, and if I was going to watch it, and if I was going to plant it, and if the seeds were going to go down, that over time, with enough sun, and with enough rain, and then me watering in between, it was going to bear fruit. God has that same expectation for us. God has, has planted us, he has planted the seed of the gospel down inside of us, and he, he waters it with his Holy Spirit, he shines on it with his Son, uh, Jesus Christ. He is doing everything he can to help us grow. God expects us to bear some fruit. He's watching. He's not watching to see if there's going to be Oprah, mm -hmm. but he's watching to see if there's going to be joy. And he's watching to see if there's going to be kindness. Yeah. And he's watching to see if there's going to be compassion. Yeah. He's watching your life every day as he gives you sermon after sermon, Bible study after Bible study, all, of, all the trappings of the Christian life. He is expecting that as you pray and as you seek his face and as you worship him, that it's going to produce something in you that only he could produce. Yeah. He's looking to get something out of you. I told my wife, if I'm planting, I want something out of you. She said, let's go get some flowers. I don't care about no pretty flowers, because I can't eat that. I want something out of it. And God's the same way. He wants something out of you. He wants righteousness. He wants holiness out of us. And he wants grace. 
And he wants mercy. And he wants to, as Reverend Jackson said earlier, he wants eventually to get something out of you that looks, sounds, and acts just like Jesus. We're expected to grow. But not only that, we're expected to teach. We're expected to teach. Let's look at verse 12. For though by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you'll come to need milk and not solid food. This teaching is essential to the Christian life. And, and, and we need to stop making excuses for why we can't teach. We need to stop making excuses about why we can't share what we know with someone else. Jesus came and he taught, he taught 12 men. One of the 12 men betrayed him. They replaced him with another. They went out. Those 12 men began to teach hundreds and thousands more. Over time, down through more than 2,000 years, through that lineage, somebody taught somebody who taught somebody else who taught somebody else. Eventually, somebody taught me, and now I'm standing here teaching you. It is yes. essential to the Christian life yes. that we share what we know. Even if we don't know chapter and verse, we ought to at least know that God is good yes. and that God answers prayer. We can at least teach somebody that much. Yes. That God is love and that God is a God of, of, of mercy. We need to be able to teach and to share with somebody. <clears throat> when I say teach, when I say teach, I'm not, I'm not talking about leading Bible study, okay? okay. Uh, that, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about preaching a sermon, okay? So don't think that Reverend Emanuel is telling you that at some point you have to stand right here in front of a whole bunch of people <coughs> and preach something and then all of them get to critique what you said because I tell you what, that's what happens. I stand up every Sunday in front of my family and my friends. They hear what I say, and some of y'all critique me when you go home. Help me, Lord. But it's a lot of pressure, but it's okay. God's got my back. But, but, but that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm asking you to do is share what you have learned about God in your daily walk with Him. Share what you have learned through your experiences. Because our experience with God is valuable. Because when we talk about what we have experienced, we're talking about something that's real. Yes. It's not just an idea or a concept. It's a, no, no, no. I can tell you that God is a healer because I remember when I was sick. And God made me well. I can, I can teach you that God is a healer because I can show you in my own life. That, that's, that's what I mean when I say share your experiences. Our answer prayers are valuable. Uh, our, even our command of the word of God is valuable. And if all we know is one verse, that one verse is valuable. Yes. You can teach that to someone. Amen. Because here's the thing, our family, our, our friends, our co-workers, our classmates, they, they need to learn from us. Amen. The world is looking for answers and we're walking around with it. Mm -hmm. It's right there inside of us. Yeah. They're angry, they're upset. Well, we, we need to go and talk to them about peace. We need to go and talk to them about the joy of the Lord. We need to talk to them about happiness in God. We need to go and talk to them about forgiveness and about. We, we, we need to be the ones. We need to be the ones who are teaching from our experience. Yes. The writer of Hebrews says that his readers should be teachers by now. Mm -hmm. These folks have been in God a few years and he's already saying, you know what, you, you should be teachers. Well, let me ask, is there a time limit? Is there a minimum amount of time that, you know, after I've been in church for oh so many years, then I'm qualified to teach? No, no, there isn't. There isn't. Let's go to, let's go to Psalm 119, verses 99 and 100. Psalm 119, verses 99 and 100. For those of you who do not know, I'm going to teach you something because this, we're talking about teaching. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter of the Bible. And it's all about, the entire thing is all about the Word of God. That's all the psalmist is singing about, the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119, verses 99 and 100. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. The 
The psalmist says in this poetic phrase, he says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. Did you hear that? I know, I understand and comprehend some things that even those who are trying to teach me cannot comprehend because I'm putting the time in meditating on God's Word. It doesn't matter how old they are or how young I am or how long they've been in church or how short amount of time I've been in church. The, the issue is, how bad do you want it? And how much effort are you willing to put into it? This verse right here, this verse set me free. As a young minister trying to understand how God wanted me to preach and how he wanted me to teach, and I'm looking around and all the other pastors and ministers are so much older than I am, and I'm trying to figure it out, God, God, how am I supposed to make this thing work? God showed me this verse. He says, it doesn't matter how long they've been preaching. <laughs> If you stay in my word, you can know everything they know. If you will just get in it. And that's what, that's what I'm trying to, to get us to understand today. That we have to put some effort into, into growing with God. It's not it's going to happen automatically. We've got to actually work on it. Let me ask you. Well, 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 don't answer this out loud. But how much are you reading? Wait a minute, maybe that's a, tr maybe that's a struggle. Maybe that's a hurdle you have to overcome. How much are you listening? How much are you studying? Are you, are you even considering meditating on God's Word? Are, are, are you putting yourself into a physical position where you can receive training and instruction from God? I know you're doing it now, and you're here Sunday morning. You can put yourself, your body is in a physical position to hear what it is that I'm saying from the pulpit. You are physically here. But outside of this, are you putting yourself in a physical position? Outside of Sunday morning, where you can get just a little bit more word in your life. Are you waking up maybe a little earlier so that you can spend some time in the Word? Are you, are you before you go to bed at night, spend a little time in the Word? Or maybe if you're on your lunch break, do you spend a little time in the Word? I mean, are you putting yourself in a position where the Word becomes prominent in your life? Are you putting yourself, uh, watch this, in a mental position where you begin to actually think about what you read? Or do you just kind of just read through the Bible? I got to read my chapter for the day. You, let's say the Lord, this, that, that, that. Hey, man, open the book. Like, it's open. Now I can go back and live in my life. Is that? Are you taking some time to let it roll over and over again in your mind? Are you in an emotional position down on the inside? where you have positioned your heart to want the Word of God, to yearn for the Word of God, to seek after the Word of God, to hunger for the Word of God. Because here's the truth. Once you get it, once you really get it, once you, once you get it, and you understand it, it's like Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in your bones. You can't wait to tell somebody. You can't wait to tell somebody what you read. You can't wait to tell somebody what you learned today. In fact, you'll start looking around. You'll sit there and read your Bible, and then a revelation hits you like, oh! Uh. And you can't find nobody to tell you. We should be sharing what we're taking. We are expected to teach. So I don't hear no more excuses about teaching. Amen? All right. Here we go. We are also expect, expected to apply. Apply the word of God. Back over in Hebrews, verses 13 and 14, he says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, watch this, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let me tell you, I've met some people in my life 
They knew some scripture. I'm talking, they could quote it, and they could tell you all the stuff about it. But they were still babies in Christ because they hadn't applied it to their lives. There are people of other religions who study the Bible stronger than we do. And they will sit there. I, I'll never forget this. We went to Morehouse College. When I was in college, we decided we were going to Morehouse. Let's just go to Morehouse. And we see the brothers over there. So I'm in the, I'm in the college with a bunch of other Christians. And we just go into Morehouse. We're going to go to a Bible study over at Morehouse. We took a road trip. And we were so excited. When we got on the campus, we got in the car. We were met by a guy who was Muslim. And he began to argue us down chapter and verse about the Bible. Well, the Bible says over in Exodus, this, that, and the other. And the Bible says over. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. You don't even believe in Jesus. <laughs> and you know more scripture than I do? At some point, it doesn't really, it doesn't really click until you let the rubber meet the road. Until you actually start to use and apply Amen. to your life Amen. what you're getting. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's look at another one. My kitchen was hijacked <laughs> by the chefs. The chefs, I asked my wife, I said last night, I said, hey, what are you, what are you making for dinner? She says, I'm not cooking, the chefs are here. Yes. Devante and his girlfriend, Brianna, came to our kitchen, and they decided they were making pizza. Now, when the chefs come to the house, I don't understand this, they use the whole kitchen. They use every pot, every pan, every utensil in the kitchen when they cook. They get flour and stuff all over the place. But here's one thing about the chefs. We call them the chefs because they're always experimenting and they're always giving us these complex meals. What I mean by complex is, they did not go to the grocery store and buy a pizza crust. They went and got the ingredients, yeast and everything, to make their own dough. They did not buy pizza sauce. They went and got the ingredients to make their own marinara sauce with all of the Italian seasonings and everything. The only thing they got that they didn't make because they didn't have time was cheese. They, they actually bought cheese. But I bet if they could, they would have been out in the backyard just churning cheese. <laughs> and, and every time the chefs come over, it's a mega event because they'll start cooking at 3. You might not eat till 8. <laughs> Because they are, I mean, they made cinnamon sticks last night with cinnamon and sugar. They made uh, two different types of pizza. I mean, they ground beef pizza. They cooked the ground beef themselves. They cooked the bacon and cut it up. They did all, they went the whole nine yards. Two weeks ago, the chef showed up and they made Chinese. I'm talking about they did their own their own fried rice. They cut up some chicken breast into little pieces and, and bread it and made their own sauce to make honey chicken or orange chicken in our house. They made their own wontons and their own, they just, the crab rangoons, they made the stuff that goes in it. It took them five hours. <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure out, well, how can I get this to happen again? <laughs> well, 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 here's the deal. Here's the deal. Every week, every week without fail, the chefs show up here at church. And we put up some complex meals. I'm talking about, I, I recognize every Sunday I'm preaching to no less than five generations. Right. And when the sermon is done, I need to know that the kids heard something, the teenagers heard something, the young adults heard something, the adults heard something, the seniors heard something, and even people who don't even know what age they are, they need to hear something too. I mean, we give you the appetizer, and we give you the salad, and we give you uh, the, the, the entree, and we give you the dessert, and we give you the after dessert coffee. We give it all. We put in pictures and, and sound and whatever, and the stories we can tell, so that everybody can leave here with something. And the question is, after you receive all of 
this. Well, what are you doing with it? Are you literally just saying that was good and you enjoyed hearing it? Because, because the writer of Hebrews said, you know what? There are folks who are just hearing it and all, and all they're doing is hearing it. They're just like babies. He says the ones that are growing are the ones who by reason of use have applied it to their lives. I am taking the word of God. Reverend Manuel said this in the sermon. I'm going to try it. Reverend Manuel said this and I'm going to try to live it. Reverend Jackson said this is sounding good. Let me see if it works. They are trying to actually go out and walk the talk. That's where the growth comes from. It comes from walking the talk. So, so, what I want to do, just like last Sunday, and I saved this point for last, is I want to give you some things to help you with your growth. Okay? If you don't, if you don't get this, if you don't get point three of this sermon, point one and two are going to be moot for you. All right. You've got to understand that you've got to apply what you get. Amen. Amen. So, so here goes. I'm going to give you three steps. I know Reverend has talked about it before, but I'm going to give them to you. Three steps that you need to take in order to apply the Word of God to your life. Amen. The first step is observation. Observation. Simply put, what does it say? When you look at the Bible and you're reading the scripture, you need to know what it says. What does it say? Not what you thought it said, what you felt like it said. What does it say? What are the words in that verse? What do those words mean? What, what's the sentence structure? Uh, what, what, what's the literary type? Is it, is it poetic? Is it, is it a narrative? Is it a word of prophecy? What, what, what kind of scripture are you looking at? What does it say? And not only what does it say, but you need to observe well, well, who is writing it. And who are they writing to? What does it say? Because we sometimes misread scripture. And I, I'll tell you that sometimes that's our fault as preachers. I'm going to lump myself in with everybody else. Sometimes we just mispreach it. We don't say it like it's supposed to be said. And we paraphrase. But when you look at the scripture, you go back and you look at it for, your, for yourself. What does it say? And listen, if you're a person like me, who at a young age had difficulty comprehending what I read, let me tell you what my mother told me. Read it again. Don't just fly through the verse and say you said all the words, but you don't know what they meant. You read the verse, but what does the verse say? Oh, no, I didn't read the words. No, 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 no. Go back and understand what you read. Okay? Read it again. For me personally, when I read scripture, just like with anything else, I am not a fast reader. I read as if somebody is talking. That's how I comprehend it. I would not look at a, a scripture and, and read it just word, word, word. I'm actually putting voice inflection with it to make it sound like a human is talking to me. That way I can understand. Everybody in my house reads faster than I do. I'm the slowest thing in the room. But this is how I get it done. Whatever it takes for you, you get it done. Okay? Second thing is the interpretation. Simply put, what does it mean? When you're looking at the Bible, wait, stop, let's go back. Let me go back to observation. If the King James Version is too difficult for you, if the new King James that I preach from is too difficult for you, I invite you to get yourself an NIV Bible, New International Version. And if that's still a challenge for you, it's okay. Get yourself a, a New Living Translation. And if, and if that doesn't work for you still, go get a children's Bible. Go get something. I'm just, and that's not a put down. I'm telling you, you do whatever it takes for you to understand the scriptures. Amen? And that's not bad. I, my first Bible was a student Bible. 
It was made for, for high school kids, and I think I was in college or something. I was so proud of my student body. I marked it up and underlined stuff and highlighted After a while, the pages weren't even the right color. But it, you know what? I was reading it, and I could understand it. So back to interpretation. What does it mean? The Bible was written. It was inspired by God, but it was written by real people in a real time and real places. And because of that, the scripture, when you read it, it has a certain meaning that the writer intended. It had a certain meaning to the people who heard it. And that meaning may not be the same as what we get out of it today. So in order to really understand what the scripture says, you need to understand what it meant to that culture and those people in that time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That John 3.16, that part of John 3.16 is almost foreign to us. But to people in Jesus' day when they heard that, it was, it was the heaviest thing somebody could say. That God had a son and that God was going to give up his son because in any family the most precious thing you could have was a son. If you were a man and you had 30 daughters and had no sons, your wife would still walk around with burial clothes on mourning as if her husband was dead. This was a serious issue. It meant something different for them than it meant for us. We need to understand what it literally meant when we're looking at, at Scripture. Get yourself a good study about it. Come to Bible study. Do whatever it takes to learn what that timeless truth is that's in that Scripture. There's a timeless truth in Scripture that is for all people in all times and all places. So you need to know what it means. Know what it says, then know what it means. Observation, then interpretation. Then the last one is application. Application. What shall I do? Now that I, I read the scripture, now that I understand and I, I know what the scripture means, what am I supposed to do with it? How does it apply to my life? How does this truth work for me in my life? How, how can I put this into practice? What, what steps do I need to take so that I can make this truth become a part of my truth, that I can become the person that God wants me to be? That is life application. When you begin to do that and, and begin to try, that's when the Holy Spirit comes in and empowers you to do things like overcome sin and, and to get your life on the right track. You've got to have that word at work and the Holy Spirit working with it apply it to your life. Because for some of us, the word is over here somewhere. We sort of read it. We don't really know what it means. And the Holy Spirit is chomping at the bits like, if you would just try. Yeah. I can get in there with you if you would just try. Yeah. I can help you if you would just try to live it. Oh, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for you to say one day, Lord, I'm tired of being a so-and-so and a such-and-such and, and I'm going to try to be who you called me to be. I'm just waiting on that day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the Holy Ghost is just hovering over some of us. Just waiting. Yeah. Application must take place over time. Because when you don't apply the word of God, you deceive yourself. Right. Oh, I, I heard it. I know what the scripture says. But it doesn't really apply to me. Okay. Nothing happened to me when I didn't try. So I must be all right. We begin to deceive ourselves. We'll come to church every Sunday. I, <laughs> you come to church every Sunday. Every Sunday without fail, I can say, thou shalt not lie. <laughs> and you'll leave right out of here and go lie on somebody. <laughs> because that scripture, you didn't want to apply that one to your life. <laughs> thou shalt not steal. And you already trying to figure out who house you going by when you leave him. <laughs> because you're not willing to apply it to you. Blessings and curses should not come out of the same fountain, but you cuss everybody out trying to get them to church, and you're going to cuss them out all the way back home from church. <laughs> As I thought. There's no more excuses about growth. No more. You know what to do now. I just gave you the steps. You know what to do. No more excuses about growth. 
No more excuses for you being in church for 10 years and you're still the same hell than you always were. At some point, you've got to grow. No more excuses uh, about, you know, well, the Lord knows my heart. No, but he knows what's in that book and you're not applying it to your heart. That's the problem. No more excuses for people pointing at us as believers and saying, why should I go to church? Because I know how so-and-so lives and I know you got brother so-and-so in there, but he does such and such. They talk about us because they see that we're not becoming who God has called us to be. The growth is important because it shows the world what Jesus is like. Oh, in the book of Romans, I know in chapter 8, when Reverend Jackson quoted verse 29, it also says in that same chapter that the whole world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The whole world, all of creation is waiting to see a true Christian stand yes. up and yeah. be a true Christian. Yes. And some of them are looking for us so, so many places. Yeah. And they keep seeing us faithful. Yeah. Oh, man. And they keep seeing us, I don't know, look churchy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But not living hope. Oh, yeah. man. That's the world that we're living in now. Yes. We live in a world where there are fewer and fewer examples because the media will always put up an example of somebody who claims they're being a Christian, but they'll only put up, they'll put people on TV when they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The news is not following you around saying, oh look, Brother Spoon didn't slash somebody's tire. <laughs> oh look, Red Manuel didn't cut somebody out. They're not following us around. Yeah. But as soon as somebody makes a mistake, they're showing the world a picture that says Christianity is not all that it's cracked up to be. And I will tell you the truth. Sometimes I'm embarrassed by things that get done in the name of Jesus. Amen. But at the end of the day, you know what it makes me do? It makes me go grab my word and read a little bit more. Amen. It makes me go and pray a little bit harder. Yes, yes, it yes. makes me want to be more like Jesus. Look, like it me. makes yes. me want somebody yes. to be able to look at me. Yes. Just look at me and yes. know that I serve yes. God. Just yes. be around me and know that yes. they are in a place filled with blessing yes. because yes. I'm there. I want to be that person that's going to shine. Yes. Yes. Because that's what God has called all of us to yes. yes. And that's who we need to be. No yes. more excuses. Yes. Yes. No more excuses. Don't, don't give me excuses. How come your life hasn't changed? Well, well no, 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 no. All I want to hear from you is I'm trying. All I want to hear from you is help me. All I want to hear from you is keep praying for me. All I want to hear from you is I'm working on it. I don't want to hear any excuses about why you could not be who God called you to be. Why you you still doing Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm going to leave that part of your life alone. But the truth is, like the writer of Hebrews says, we ought to be further along. We should be teachers about that. We should be letting somebody else know about the grace of God. We should be a walking example that others can follow. That we can be just like the Apostle Paul and say, you know what, I don't have it all together, but if you will, just follow me while I follow Christ. Know that I might slip up and fall every once in a while, but I'm still going to keep going in that direction, even now that I fall. Follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah, yeah. The doors of the church are open. If you are here today, and you have not made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we invite you to come to know him for yourself. <laughs> come to Jesus. Come to Jesus.